Hi, welcome back. In financial markets, or in any, any markets, it's not uncommon for participants to disagree about what's coming in the future. Is risk going to increase or is it going to decrease? There are always disagreements of opinion. In fact, you could argue that all trading is based on disagreements of opinion. That said, though, we are in a strange market. A strange market that I think can be best described by going back to how Charles Dickens started Tale of Two Cities. He said, the best of times was the worst of times, the age of wisdom, the age of foolishness. And he ends up, we're all going direct to heaven or we're all going direct the other way. You see, what's this got to do with markets? I think we live in a market where there is a huge divergence of opinion. There are some people who believe that are in the, we're on the verge of a massive contraction, a, a collapse of a bubble, so to speak. And there are others who seem to believe that we're on the cusp of a bull market. On the economy, there are some who believe that we're, on the, we're at the beginning of a huge you know, surge in growth. And there are others who believe that we're on the tipping point to what could be an economic depression. In other words, the disagreements are not just there, but they're wider than they've ever been before. So one of the things I'd like to, uh, to kind of present is the degree of disagreement even within the market on different indicators and perhaps look at why the disagreements are as, as, as wide as they are right now. So let's start with one of the basic issues. Is risk coming, is, is the risk that we see in markets, is it going to be higher or lower? Is risk going to go up or down? And they're going to be, there are two indicators that I'd like to present to you. The first are market indicators of risk. Market indicators of risk, including the volatility indices, the VIX, um, the default spreads, bond yield spreads, and the other is economic policy uncertainty. And I'm going to argue that the two indicators are giving very different signals about the future. Let's start with the market indicators. In fact, if the, for the last two decades, we've used the VIX as a measure of how much uncertainty investors see in stocks. So if you look at this graph, I've graphed out the VIX from the end of 2000, December 2015 all the way through June of 2017. And if you look at this graph and if you break down the trend lines, here's what you see. In the months prior to November of 2016, the VIX was at 15.82. And in the months after, it's 12. that's a 22.47% drop in the VIX. Lest you feel that this is somehow just restricted the U.S., I'm going to take that off the table because if you look at the European VIX, the drop has been even larger. So stocks across developed markets have shown a substantial drop in volatility. In fact, even the, though I don't have a VIX for emerging markets, when looking at the numbers, the volatility indicators there seem to have come down as well. So there's been a global drop in volatility perceptions about equity markets. Is it just restricted to equity markets? Not quite, because if you look at the T-bond yield of volatility, that's gone down about 23% since the election, as is corporate bond volatility. In fact, every measure of market volatility that I, I could find has shown a drop since November of 2016. So the market indicators are all seem to be all seem to be signaling that risk is, as they see it at least, has come down in the last few months. I think, what's the big deal? If you look at economic policy uncertainty, the signals seem to be pushing in the other direction. In fact, there's an index called the Economic Policy Uncertainty Index. It's a fairly recent origin, but it's got pretty good, it's, it comes with pretty good pedigree. It, it actually is based on three things. It's based on newspaper articles about markets. You're saying, big deal, who cares about those? It looks at um, the CBO's estimates of uh, temporary provisions in the tax code as a, as a measure of uncertainty about taxes. And third, it, it looks at forecasting you know, divergences among economic forecasters about what's coming up for the economy. This composite indicator is flashing the exact opposite signal as market indicators are. It's showing a significant jump in uncertainty since November of 2016. In fact, a couple of these indicators have hit historic highs just in the last few months. So we have this divergence. Market indicators seem to be suggesting risk is coming down, and economic policy indicators seem to suggest the risk is going up. Let's move on. Let's think about fund flow. Ultimately, one measure of how confident investors feel about an asset class or market is how willing they are to put money into the market. So a measure of, of, of the perceived risk in a market is funds flow into the market. So if people are feeling risk averse and worried about a market, funds tend to move out of the market. There's a flow out. And if they feel sanguine, pretty good about the market, 
funds tend to flow in. So are funds flowing into the market or out of the market? To get a measure of this, I looked at the fund flows into different kinds of funds, domestic funds, global funds, bond funds, commodity funds. And for every class of funds other than commodity funds, you see more funds flowing into these markets since November of 2016 than there were prior to November of 2016. So as with the market volatility indicators, investors seem to be putting their money where their risk indicators are and putting money into these markets. Again, it's not just the U.S., it's global flows into financial markets. You're saying, what's, what's the sore point there? Well, there are three potential discordant notes. The first is, there are people who've been bearish about the market now for a while, three, four, five years. They become even more bearish because now, in addition to their concerns, which have historically been around high PE ratios, now you have additional concerns about economic uncertainty and where the market is going. There are a few big name investors who historically have not been bearish about the market, who've turned bearish about the market. Jeff Gunlack, for instance, you know, is, is uh, suggested just in the last few weeks, that it's time to sell the S&P 500 and buy emerging market stocks. And there is also some evidence that funds are flowing out of U.S. stocks into European stocks, though not in the degree that would cause U.S. stocks to collapse. But there is some indication that even in the funds flow, you're getting both funds flowing in and out of markets, maybe not the degree of divergence you saw with the risk indicators, but divergence nevertheless. Which brings me to my third factor, which is ultimately we can talk about investor, you know, investor risk perceptions and economic policy uncertainty, but this is an economy built on consumer spending and business investment. So you could argue that maybe the ultimate indicator we should be looking at is how confident investors feel, mood indicators for both consumers and businesses about the future, which is captured in, in confidence measures. And the second is spending indicators, both in consumer spending and business investment. Here again, you're getting different signals depending on whether you look at the mood indicators or the spending indicators. Let's start with the mood indicators first. If you look at the mood indicators, there's been an increase in confidence since the, since November. Though the jump has been much greater in the conference board indicators than in the University of Michigan consumer confidence measures, but there's been a jump nevertheless in both indicators. Consumers are getting more confident. The same thing can be said about businesses. Businesses are, and, and there are a couple of indicators on this, business confidence has also jumped especially in the first quarter of 2017. So consumers and businesses are feeling more confident about the future. You think that's good, right? They're spending more. Well, that, that's a more of a may. In fact, consumer spending has not jumped. In fact, the growth in consumer spending is very close to what it was last year, both in just in terms of retail spending and overall consumption expenditure. The same is true for business investment. Businesses are feeling confident, but you're not seeing a sudden jump in capital expenditures or business investment yet. So here again, the mood indicators are suggesting good news and the spending indicators are not as optimistic about the future. So clearly on every dimension, you're seeing push and pull. One set of indicators pushing you today, a good times are coming. Another set of indicators suggesting a not so fast. So how do you explain the divergence we're seeing in markets right now? I would argue there are three reasons and they're not mutually exclusive. In fact, I think all three apply. The first is investors have become crisis weary. For the last decade, it's been one crisis after another crisis. Every year, there's another big crisis. And with every crisis, if you listen to the experts, here's what they say. This is the big one. And after about the seventh or eighth of these crises, where they say it's a big one, but markets seem to roll through them, maybe investors are starting to ignore these experts, like the boy who cried wolf, and essentially start to roll with the punches. So essentially, markets, I think, have become inured to crises. The second is, I think, markets, there, there's a divergence of views about both the magnitude of economic policy change that's coming and the magnitude of the consequences of that change. Again, if you listen to the economic policy experts, they're all caught up in how much change is coming. But investors have become cynical. They've seen governments, they've seen that governments like to talk about big change, but they don't like to make big change. And they've also seen that when economic policy changes are made, the consequences are never as large as they're made out to be. In fact, I would argue for the last decade, what we've seen is central banks in particular have tried to create policy changes, but the consequences have not been as they expected. So I think perhaps because of globalization, perhaps because of the power of markets, the power that governments and central banks have, 
to alter the courses of eco economies have decreased and perhaps that's being captured in this in this discordant signals you're getting from economic policy uncertainty and market uncertainty. And thirdly, we live in political times. That goes without saying. And in an age of political partisanship where every news item is perceived differently depending on which side of the divide you're in, why would markets be any different? In fact, I would argue that this is a very political market. In other words, you tell me what you think about the government and I could probably tell you whether you're bullish or bearish. You know, in fact, in the U.S., this is particularly stark where, you know, if you're a, if you're on, on one side of the political divide, perhaps a Trump supporter, you feel bullish about markets and bullish about the economy. And the other side of the divide, you're convinced that only bad times are coming. This is a very political market. And perhaps that explains some of the divergence as well. So what am I going to do? Well, when I'm in doubt, I always go back to my tiebreaker. In other words, I let the numbers tell me the story, because if I don't, my biases are going to tell the story. So here's what I do. I compute the implied equity risk premium. This is actually the return I back out of the S&P 500 at the start of every month based on what the index is trading at and my expected cash flows. I have to make some implicit, some assumptions to get there, but those assumptions have stayed pretty much the same over time. So if nothing else, this is kind of an unbiased view of what the numbers are saying. And at the start of June of 2017, here's what the numbers look like. The S&P 500 was at 2,411.8. My expected cash flows are outlined there. And based on those expected cash flows and the level of the index, the expected return on stocks, the internal rate of return, is about 7.5%. You subtract out the risk-free rate of 2.21%, the 10-year T-bond rate, and you get an implied equity risk premium of 5.29%. You're saying, so what? What does that mean? Well, to give you some sense of perspective, let me go back and compare this equity risk premium to the numbers over time. The average implied equity risk premium for the S&P 500 from 1961 through 2017 is 4.17%. The average implied equity risk premium over the last 20 years is 4.4%. The equity risk premium June 1st of 2017 is 5.29%. You're saying, still, so what? Well, here's the way I think about the implied equity risk premium. If that number is a low number relative to history, that's a sign that you should be worried that stocks are perhaps overpriced, overheated. Take a look at the end of 99, that dot-com bubble. The implied equity risk premium in the U.S. dropped to 2%. That was definitely a problem. Today, we're at 5.29%. That's higher than the historic average. So if nothing else, if you just looked at the implied equity risk premium, it seems to be okay. Here's my cautionary note, though. It looks okay partly because T-bond rates are at historic lows, 2.21%. In fact, T-bond rates today were what they were in 2007, 4.5%. The implied equity risk premium today would be 3%, close to the danger zone. So that's the first, first factor that's keeping equity risk premiums elevated is low risk-free rates. The other is U.S. companies are returning historically high amounts of cash flows in the form of dividends and buybacks. In fact, last year they returned just over 100% of earnings as dividends and buybacks, and you could argue that that's unsustainable. So the two worrisome signs are low risk-free rates and cash flows that cannot be sustained. And here again, I can give you some good news and bad news. The good news is, at the start of this year, the T-bond rate was 2.45%. It's actually lower now than it was at the start of the year, notwithstanding noises about the Fed raising rates. The second piece of good news is earnings finally are starting to climb after a couple of years of declines. Earnings in the first quarter of 2017 were up almost 17% for the S&P 500 companies. That's a good news. What's the bad news? Well, it looks almost certain now that the Fed will raise rates again in June of 2000 in the coming months. But the effect of that on long-term rates, we don't know yet. The second is there are signs that you're seeing a pullback in buybacks, that there's going to be less buybacks going forward. We'll see how these numbers play out, but I plan to keep track of these numbers. So here's where I stand. What do I think about markets? I'm not sure. We could be on the cusp of the biggest bull market of all time or a huge bear market. We could be on the cusp of great economic times or a downturn. You're saying, this is not very helpful. You're right. I'm not a market timer. And that's, this is precisely why I'm not a market timer. Calling this market is impossible to do. Anybody who claims certitude in this market is lying. 
So what should I do? Well, I'm going to do what I've always done, which is I let the market do what it does. I'm going to go find stocks that look cheap. I am a stock picker, not a market timer. And if nothing else, this, this, this analysis, this research, if you can call it, has reaffirmed that position. We live in uncertain times. We live in times where if you listen to one person, you're going to be told one end of, you're going to be at one end of the spectrum. You listen to other, another person, you're going to, you're going to be buying stocks and selling stocks like crazy if you listen to the market timers. So watch the markets. I'm not suggesting there aren't any danger signals, but let the numbers drive what you do. Thank you very much for listening.